أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله All praise is due to Allah We seek his help and his forgiveness Whomever Allah guides, no one can misguide, and whomever Allah leads to go astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God except Allah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final message. My dear brothers and sisters, inshallah, today we're going to talk about the tafsir of Surat al-Masad. Surat al-Masad is one of the early surahs that were referred to, the, that were revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Sabab al Nuzul, the reason it was revealed is because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Deliver the message or warn uh, your close clan, referring to the people of Mecca. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on top of mountain As-Safa and he started calling upon people to gather around. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked them, he said, if I were to tell you that there is a massive army right behind me, and we all know that story, will you believe me? And of course, even though they cannot see the army, they said, yes, we would believe you because we have never experienced you lying ever at all. So subhanAllah, they would deny their own eyes, but believe the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of how truthful he is. As we said, his nickname was as His nickname was the truthful, the most honest. So they said, we would believe you, even though they cannot see it with their own eyes. So then the Prophet wasallam said, I am the messenger of Allah to you, to warn you about the punishment of a severe punishment in the hellfire and to give you the glad tidings of Jannah and to tell you that if you follow me, if you believe in me, you will lead the Arabs, you will be the most victorious or the most um, dignified among the Arabs. So who responded to the Prophet wasallam? Everybody was quiet except his uncle Abu Lahab. His uncle Abu Lahab immediately said, تَبَّنْ لَكَ سَائِرَ الْيَوْمِ تَبَّنْ لَكَ سَائِرَ الْيَوْمِ أَلِي هَذَا جَمَعْتَنَا تَبَّنْ which is the first word mentioned in this surah. تَبَّتْ يَدَى So Abu Lahab, when he heard the Prophet وسلم, saying that, he said to him, تَبَّنْ لَكَ May you perish which means may you be destroyed. He's making a dua against the Prophet Sallallahu So this was an insult. May you perish, right? He is asking God to make the Prophet be destroyed or be perished because of what he just said. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed these verses, Tabbat Yada, which is the same word that Abu Lahab used to refer to the Prophet Sallallahu or to make dua against the Prophet Sallallahu so tabbat is a dua. May he perish. So tabbat is a dua, as we said, just like the dua he made against the Prophet Sallallahu Allah revealed the words tabbat against Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the word tabbat literally means may he or it perish. May it be destroyed. Then the second word is yada. Yada means the two hands, two hands of Abu Lahab. So why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, may the two hands of Abu Lahab be destroyed or perished? This is something in Arabic language, which is, this is a technique using part of the body of a person to refer to the whole person. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse, كل شيء هالك إلا وجهه that everything will come to an end. Everything will come to an end except his face, meaning the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So somebody might ask, does that mean Allah's face is the only thing that will not come to an end? What about Allah himself? So the scholar said that وجهه, the face of Allah, refers to Allah himself subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the self the divine self of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is also common in our language. Sometimes you hate somebody so much you say to him, I don't want to see your face ever again, or don't show me your face, your face here ever again. 
does that mean if that person comes to your house wearing a mask, you're going to let them in or that you're going to be happy that they are in? No. When you say, I don't want to see your face again, that means I don't want to see you as a person, all of you ever again. Same thing applies. We say sometimes, I don't want your foot to step here ever again. Does that mean if he comes walking on his hands, it's okay? No, it's an expression to refer. You use part of the body to refer to the whole person. And that's exactly what's happening here. So, tabbat yada means may he perish all of Abu Lahab, but he used the hands of Abu Lahab to refer to the whole person like we just explained. And also some scholars say it's because the hands is what he uses to do all of his evil work. He uses his hands to do all of his evil work. Now, this is the first part. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Tabbat yada, may Abu Lahab perish, may he be destroyed. And Abi Lahab is his name. That's the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu had 10 uncles. Had, uh, the, 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 he had a father and nine uncles. So the, 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 the sons of Abdul Muttalib were 10. So some of them, they didn't even, they weren't alive when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi received the message. Only four of them were alive when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi received the message. Two of them became Muslims and they are going to be in the highest level in Jannah. Al-Abbas and Hamza. And two of them are going to be in Jahannam. One is going to be getting one of the worst punishments in Jahannam, Abu Lahab, the one we're talking about today. And one will be getting the least punishment in Jahannam, who, and this one is Abu Talib that we talked about before. So Abu Lahab is a nickname. His name was Abdul Uzza, the worshipper of Al Uzza. And we know, and I, we talked about this in another khutbah, that in, in Arabic language, when you refer to somebody by his kunya, by his nickname, it's out of respect. So if your son is Muhammad, you say to the father, Abu Muhammad, this is out of respect. The father of Muhammad, it's out of respect. And sometimes Abu can mean the one who has something. So you say Abu, uh, Abu Sha'ar, the one who has like really nice hair. And Abu Lahab in this one here means the one with a flame. And we will explain what that means. So before we explain what that means, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to Abu Lahab with his nickname, which is used in Arabic language, to respect the person, even though that person is going to perish and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising, giving him the, the promise of being in Jahannam and all of these things. The scholars had two opinions. They said that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to refer to him with Abdul Uzza, the worshipper of Al Uzza, and that was an idol that they worshipped. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to confirm that there is any other ilah or any, uh, that anyone can be abd, a worshipper, to any other god than him. And they also said there were a lot of people named Abdul Uzza. So if Allah said Abdul Uzza, people were going to be confused which one is Allah referring to. And the other opinion is that Abu Lahab is because of his facial features. He had like redness in his cheeks, like a flame was on his face. And also it kind of agrees with, with what is going to happen to him in the future. That he's going to be in Jahannam, full of in, inside the flames of Jahannam. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used Abi Lahab instead of Abdul Uzza. So Allah did not mean to respect him in that context, but as we said, it's because of the situation and the context. Now the next part is Watab, which is the same word as Tabbat. Tabbat is, as we said, may it be destroyed. That's a dua. Now this Watab here, and he is perished and he is destroyed. He it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is telling that this has already happened. And this is actually a past word. Watab. Subhanallah. And this is something that brings us to the past in the Quran. So Allah is talking about him in his life. That person is still alive. But Allah says that he perished. He is doomed. He is destroyed. But he's still alive. 
And in other verses, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, talking to Prophet uh, Isa alayhi salam in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And he says, وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَ إِلَهَيْنِ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ the verse literally said, Behold, Allah said to the son of, to Isa, the son of Maryam, Aanta, did you qulta, say, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as two gods instead of Allah? Qala subhanak, he said, Glory be to you. I did not say any of that. So why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? talking about something in the past, even though it hasn't happened yet, this is going to happen in the hereafter. Allah will talk to Prophet Isa in front of the Christians, in front of everyone. Did you tell these people to worship you and your mother and to take you as two gods instead of worshiping me? And Prophet Isa salam will say, Subhanak, glory be to you. I did not tell them except what you told me. So, and, and also we have heard the, the speech of shaitan. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ Shaytan said when the matter has been decided. This is also in the hereafter. Shaytan will give will in the future, give his speech. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking in the past? And the scholar said, it's to show that this has already happened in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This has already happened in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing can change it. And this is going to help us to understand because some people will claim as we're going to see in the, in the rest, some people are going to make some ridiculous claim about this uncle of the Prophet Abu Lahab. And we, this is a proof that this will never change. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about him in the past because it happened in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Abu Lahab, the next verse says, Ma aghna anhu. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a dua that he may he perish, may he be destroyed, and he is destroyed, he will be destroyed. Ma aghna anhu. That means it will not protect him. Also, it is used in the past, but it means the future because it happened in the knowledge of Allah. It will not protect him. What will not protect him? Maluhu, his wealth. Maluhu, wama kasab. The literal meaning of wama kasab is what he earned. But the Prophet said in authentic hadith, al waladu min kasbi abi, that a son or a daughter is from the kasb, which is the same word here, his father. It's from the kasb, it's from the earning of his father. So the scholar said, wama kasab means his offspring, his children will not protect him on the day of judgment. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah uh, Al-Shu'ara, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بنون. On that day, no one can help you, no one can protect you, neither money, neither wealth, nor your children. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except those who come to Allah with a pure heart, with a heart, a sound heart. So Allah says in that verse, neither his wealth nor his money will help him or protect him. And the scholar said that he actually used to say that if my nephew, referring to the Prophet وسلم, is saying the truth, then I will take my money, I will use my wealth, I will use my children to save myself from that punishment that he claims is going to happen to me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to him that neither your money nor your children, no one will protect you on the day of judgment. مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبْ سَيَصْلَى He will burn. سَيَصْلَى نَارًا He will burn in a fire. ذَاتَ لَهَبْ With flame. And that's because of what he did to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, imagine if he didn't say that thing he said as, as soon as the Prophet ﷺ invited everybody and told them, would you believe me if I told you there, are, there is a huge army behind me? In addition to that, he would walk behind the Prophet. The Prophet now received a message from Allah. He's trying to deliver it to the people. He's trying to find somebody to help him, support him, and to, to, to stop the, the torture that is happening to his companions. Yet this man would go behind the Prophet wherever he goes, 
And the Prophet is telling people, inviting people to Islam, and this man would say, do not believe him. He's my nephew, I know him. Do not believe him. He is a liar, he's an apostate. And subhanAllah, if this comes from somebody who's so close to you, it has a stronger effect. I am sure, I, uh, in the past, I was trying to uh, rent a room in my house. And I, I wanted some, uh, somebody like wanted to get that room. And I told him, do you have any recommendation? And he said, yes, my father. So his father sent me an email and he said, don't worry, if he doesn't pay, I will take care of it. So I felt so secure because his father is the one who's going to take care of it if he doesn't pay. So imagine the opposite. If the father says, I'm never going to give you any money if he doesn't pay. I don't, I have nothing to do with him. I would never have given him the rule. So this here has a stronger effect because this is his uncle telling people, I know him. This is my nephew. He's a liar. He's an apostate. Do not believe him. So sayasla nar on that lahab. And here we have a miracle or a prophecy, if you will. The Prophet the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this verse that Abu Lahab is going to be burning in a blazing fire or in a fire with a flame. Now Abu Lahab was such an enemy, he had lots of friends who were enemies of the Prophet. They literally could have destroyed Islam and the message of the Prophet Muhammad by just saying one word. The Quran confirms that Abu Lahab is going to the hellfire. This is a future, this is a prophecy. If Abu Lahab just said La ilaha illallah, even though he's lying, like if he made it as a lie and he's hiding kufr within his heart. If he said it as a lie, he would have proved Islam to be a false religion. He would have proved the Prophet ﷺ to be a liar like he claimed. Because subhanAllah, the Quran says he's going to hellfire. If he says, I'm a Muslim, how is he going to go to hellfire? Right? He would have destroyed the religion of Islam if he said, I'm a Muslim, or if he converted to Islam just for the sake of destroying Islam. But subhanAllah, he lived his whole life and died as an enemy to the Prophet ﷺ without converting to Islam and without even pretending to convert to Islam. Another thing here is nepotism. And this is the point I wanted to mention. SubhanAllah, this is the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Yet because of his disbelief, because of his enmity to the Prophet ﷺ, he will go to Jahannam forever. SubhanAllah, may Allah protect us from Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who go to Jannah without any judgment, without any hisab, without any adab or any torture or any punishment. Ameen. He's going to live his entire life eating and drinking nothing but fire. Imagine living in a volcano, brothers and sisters, yet the hellfire is so much worse than a volcano. And the people in Jahannam will even call, O oh Malik, they will say, Ya Malik, liyaqdi alayna rabbuk. Malik is the khazin of Allah, the, the angel that is the gatekeeper of Jahannam. They will say, let your Lord put an end to us. We don't want to exist anymore, subhanAllah. And Malik responds, makithun. You're staying there forever. You're never coming out. So why would this man do something like that? SubhanAllah, it's because of his pride, because of his arrogance, because of his jealousy. I am one of the richest in Mecca. I have all the, that, that honor. How could I believe in him who is younger than me, who is my nephew, etc.? So he chose, subhanAllah, this awful punishment than believing in the Prophet ﷺ because of his arrogance and his hasad and his subhanAllah. So even though he's the uncle of the Prophet, there is no nepotism in Islam. The, the son of Nuh, Nuh is the Prophet that we all know, alayhi salam. The Prophet Nuh, alayhi salam, said to him, Ya Bunayyar ma'ana, oh my son, ride with me, ride with us on the boat. But he said, well, don't be with those who disbelieve. Qala sa'awi ila jabal. He said, I'm going to go on a mountain. Ya asimuni min al ma to protect me from the water. Qala la asim al yawma min amri allahi illa man rahim. No one is going to be protected today from the commandment of Allah, from this matter, from the flood, except those who Allah chose to have their, His mercy on. وَحَالَ بَيْنَهُمَ الْمَوْجُ فَكَانَ مِنَ الْمُغْرَقِينَ Then the waves come and the son of Nuh drowned. So because he's the son of a prophet, doesn't mean he's automatically going to Jannah. 
And because Abu Lahab is the uncle of a prophet doesn't mean he's going automatically to Jannah. Because as we said, some people say that this man will come out of Jahannam because he was the uncle of, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some people say that he comes out of Jahannam on the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these all are lies. They have nothing to do with authenticity or authentic hadith or authentic narrations. So there is no nepotism in Islam and subhanAllah unfortunately nepotism is now a big problem in, in the Muslim world and all of the Arab countries. A person could get a job that they're not qualified for is just because they are related to somebody who is in a higher position or somebody who they know is in that position. Even though the people who are really qualified for the job, they don't get it because they don't have any relatives in that position. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us, do not depend on who you're related to. Do what is just, do what is right. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept from anyone, no matter who they are, unless they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, so we said, Sayasla naran that lahab, that he is going to be burning in a fire with flame, with blazing flame. And that's because of what he did to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not only he, but also his wife, wamra'atuhu. And that means, that means, and his wife. His wife also is going to be in the blazing fire with him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hamalat al hatab So this woman heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well, excuse me. She, she would take, Hamalat al hatab means the carrier of wood. She would carry wood that has thorns in it and put it in the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that when he goes out to pray, he steps on the thorns and it hurts his feet and it makes him bleed. In addition to that, when this surah was revealed, she took a rock and she went looking for the Prophet ﷺ. She asked, where is he? They told her he is at the Kaaba. <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. They both were uh, leaning their back to the Kaaba. So she comes and Abu Bakr tells the Prophet ﷺ that she's coming towards us with a rock. And the Prophet ﷺ tells him, don't worry. She comes and she starts talking to Abu Bakr, where is your friend? And the Prophet ﷺ is sitting right next to him. And Abu Bakr just couldn't understand what's going on and he didn't say anything. Then she told him to tell, Abu ba to, to tell the Prophet ﷺ, that Muhammad, instead of saying Muhammad, she said Mudhammam, which is the opposite of his name. Muhammad means the one who deserves praise, the praiseworthy. So she made it the opposite, Mudhammam, the one who deserves to be humiliated. Asayna, so we disobey uh, Mudhammam, referring to the Prophet and his religion we reject and his God we, we did, don't disbelieve in him. So now she's taking the rock, she's trying to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's sitting right in front of her, but SubhanAllah, she cannot see him. After she left, Abu Bakr looked at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah put a barrier between me and her, she could not see me. And this is a miracle to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. So his wife, not only did she try to put the, the, the thorny wood in the path of the Prophet ﷺ, but also she tried to kill the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why she's going to be in Jahannam with her husband. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes her Fijidiha means in her neck. And habl is a rope. Min masad. Masad is referring to the kind of rope it is. Some scholars said it's like palm fiber, and some scholars said it's steel, like it's a chain, and some scholars said it's something from the hellfire, I mean masad from the hellfire. And why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say fi jidiha? It's because of she used to wear a necklace. So jidiha, as we said, is her neck. She used to wear a necklace that was very valuable and very expensive. And she said that I'm going to sell that necklace and buy weapons or help those who are fighting against Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So because of her doing that 
and saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells her that her punishment is going to be similar to what she claimed in her neck instead of that necklace that Allah gave to her is going to be a rope or a, a chain of steel in the hellfire to punish her because of what she did to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is a reminder for us, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala blessed you with money, with wealth, use it for the sake of Allah, do not use it against Allah, so, do not, so that you don't end up being punished by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Now, how did he die? How did uh, Abu Lahab die? And after the, uh, during the battle of Badr, Abu Lahab didn't wanna go fight. And there was a man that owed Abu Lahab a lot of money. So Abu Lahab said, go fight in my place and I will not take that money from you. I will drop your debt. So the man went in place of Abu Lahab to fight in the battle of Badr. Subhanallah, now the disbelievers assembled an army of 1,000 men to fight against the Prophet Sallallahu whose army was only 300 Muslims and they were so as we know, they, they were driven out of their homes. They were very poor. They did not have anything. They did not have enough weapons. So now 1,000 of the disbelievers, again, it's only 300 of the Muslims. And the disbelievers are the ones are, that are going to them. That's how confident they are that they're going to win this battle. So of course, Abu Lahab is in Mecca waiting behind. And he knows that his army, he thinks that his army is going to win this battle. So he's waiting to hear the news. And the narrator of this story is Rafa, who is one of the, uh, he was a servant for Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu who was a Muslim in secret at that time. So this Mawla, this servant, he says that I was sitting uh, with the wife of Al-Abbas and I was making cups for the, for the Zamzam water. And Abu Lahab came and he was sitting near me. And while he's sitting there, he heard that Abu Sufyan came back. So he said, somebody bring Abu Sufyan to tell us what happened in the battle. So Abu Sufyan comes and he brings people around and he starts telling them the story. So he says that we have been defeated. They have, it's like we were giving them ourselves to kill us. It's like we were giving them ourselves so that they capture us. Then Abu Sufyan says something strange, subhanAllah, he says, and I do not blame any of the people in my army for being defeated or for being captured. So Abu, uh, Abu Lahab says, why? He says, I saw men wearing white clothes on horses. The Prophet and his companions they did not have the, the luxury of having horses with horses that are black and white. They didn't have any weapons, yet they were fighting and they were killing us. So immediately Rafi', the Mawla or the servant of Al-Abbas, he says, these are the angels. These are the angels. So Abu Lahab got mad as soon as Abu Rafi' said that. And Abu Rafi' was such a weak boy, he was very thin. So he immediately jumped on Rafi' and he started beating him. The wife of Al-Abbas, the one who owns that servant, or the one who uh, has the servant in her home, as soon as she saw that, she couldn't handle it. Immediately she attacked. She was also a secret Muslim, and Rafa, the servant, was a secret Muslim at that time. So she immediately attacked Abu Lahab to protect her servant from Abu Lahab. She grabbed a stick and she hit Abu Lahab on his head. She cut him open in his head. This wound, subhanAllah, caused him to have a disease. It got infected and he got a disease. And this disease was infectious. They call it Al-Adas. It was infectious and the, the Qurayshis, the people in Quraysh at that time, they didn't want to be near anyone that had that disease. Seven days after this incident, he dies. No one can touch him. They put him, they, they, uh, they kind of tried to grab him with pieces of wood so that they don't touch him. They put him next to a wall and they pushed the wall on him and they started throwing stones to make it kind of like a grave without touching him at all. So subhanAllah, that's how he perished. That's how we, he was tab as the surah said, tab that he perished in this life 
wa fil akhira and in the hereafter sayasla naran that lahab he will burn in a blazing fire forever and that's because of his enmity because of his uh, torture to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, standing in the way of the Messenger of Allah, delivering his message, insulting him, helping his enemies, waging a war against him, trying to kill him and trying to kill all those who follow him. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala protect us and protect our families from Jahannam. And may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala make us of those who go to Jannah without any hisab or adab. Inshallah, next time we'll talk about Surah Al-Nasr. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-azim ali wa lakum. Please let me know if you have any questions. If you don't, inshallah, we'll start the Kahoot. <coughs> I will stop the recording here.